Today we are doing my final 2022 type wrap up because we are talking about my superlatives and my reading stats for the year. So well and truly done with 2022. RIP. Very sad that all the list stuff is slowly coming to an end. I love this time of year, you guys know. But I started capping off the end of my year with doing superlatives. So think kind of like I've seen some people call it like the book awards or the book Oscars. These are sort of like different categories that I have that I'm giving best and worst to. So we'll do that. And then we will also go through all of my super nerdy stats, which I just get so excited whenever it's time to talk about that again. <laughs> so this is the one time of, I saw it. Well, I guess you guys have to deal with my stats and my monthly wrap ups. Okay, you guys get stats with some frequency for me, but this is like the big one. Okay. And I love it. I love seeing other people's so fun. Anyway, we're gonna start with superlatives and then we will go into stats. So superlatives, best writing that I encountered in 2022. And this is at the bottom of the pile that I just pulled. So let's try not to knock them all over. Oh, okay, I did it. Her Body and Other Parties by Carmen Maria Machado. I think that I picked this for this book in particular, but I think having read this and in the dream house in 2022, Carmen Maria Machado's actual writing is my new favorite writing that I found from an author for 2022. I feel like that this is inventive and has something to say, which is what I really respect about her work. It is not like overly flowery or anything, but her words are chosen with intention. And there is a richness to the meaning that she infuses in her writing that I think is very difficult to do. And she, I mean, she's a national book award finalist. I'm not unique in this opinion, but I think she is an absolute master and I need more. So Carmen, give me more. I need more, please. And I did also want to give a lifetime achievement award for writing because I think I have an author I would now say is the greatest in their genre that I've encountered. And their writing just for the last three years has been a joy. And I would now put them as one of my all time favorite writers. So Lifetime Achievement for Writing Award is gonna go to Robin Hobb, because she is a master. Her books are beautifully written, so well developed in their characters, so subtle in their world building and plot buildup. There's a coziness to her writing, but there's also this unflinching willingness to confront the realities of the situation she has set up in the text. She is just a master. So lifetime achievement for writing goes to Robin Hobb this year. And then we're gonna do most overhyped, correctly hyped and underhyped. Most overhyped. The Atlas Six, in my opinion, I just think it is speaking of, in contrast to amazing writing, horribly written in my opinion. <laughs> It's so overwritten. I just feel, you know, if you need 10 words to describe something, Olivia Blake is going to give you 200 words to describe it. It's just agonizing. For me, it was agonizing to read. And this is why good writing and bad writing is always, a, you know, is subjective to some degree because other people love that quality. There's another author on this list who people, other people hate her writing. But for me, it's exactly what I want. So totally, there's a subjective element to this. For me, for my taste, Olive e. Blake's writing is absolute torture. So for me, the Atlas Six is so overhyped this year. Correctly hyped, I'm gonna give to the fifth season by N.K. Jemisin. This is as wonderfully written as everyone said it was. The world building is as good. The character work is as compelling. This is as great as everybody says it is. And I definitely wanna finish this trilogy in 2023. Most underhyped book, I am giving to Kate Williams' Never Coming Home. This was definitely the best YA thriller I read this year. And I didn't see really anyone talking about this besides me. So I'm gonna say this is underhyped and I hope I actually, it has warmed my heart to see how many of you have told me that you picked this up on my recommendation and how much you liked it. I mean, not that everybody is going to love it if they pick it up on my recommendation, but I've had a very high hit rate of people coming back and saying, oh, I'm so glad I picked that up. Yes, it's so good. And I feel like, feel like it's very underhyped. So if you like the idea of Agatha Christie's and then there were none meets Fire Festival in Upper YA Thriller, pick this one up. It deserves a lot more love than it's gotten. Oh, and I added an underhyped series. And I can't talk about this at length because this is from Harper Voyager and Harper, as of this filming, at least the Harper Collins union strike is still happening. So can't talk about this in detail, but I will say that I think that the most underhyped series that I read this year is Rainwild Chronicles. 
everybody told me to like strap in because this was the worst part of the Realm of the Elderlings and I totally disagree. So underhyped for me. Okay, and then I've got three character related ones. So favorite main character I'm giving to Dina DeMille from the Innkeeper Chronicles series. I did a reread slash catching up with through the new release that came out this year of the Innkeeper's Chronicle. I did my whole second season of my podcast for this series. So clearly I love it. It's just it's so cozy and so lovely. And Dina DeMille is a wonderful Lona Andrews heroine. I think she has a distinct flavor uh, as opposed to Kate Daniels, who is the best known Alana Andrews main character, but also from Nevada Baylor. I think that she has her own vibe. Like she's an innkeeper. And so she really values being home and rootedness and, you know, consistency with one place. And she isn't trying to do something that big other than find her family and protect her guests at her end. So I just love Dina. She's so wonderful. And it was a pleasure to spend time with her again. So she was my favorite main character. I'm going to give my favorite side character to Legends and Lattes, uh, Thimble. And I'm also going to give this my the, the next one is favorite ensemble. This was my favorite ensemble cast. Thimble was the best side character I read this year. Thimble is the baker and he's like a little badger and a sea creature and he makes these delicious bakes. And he's just he steals my heart in every scene that he's in. Um, he makes his these little biscotti that everybody loves and these cinnamon buns everyone loves. Oh, he's just so wonderful. So he was wonderful. And the entire cast together of Legends and Lattes is just a great ensemble piece, I think. So cozy. I'm gonna add one that I didn't originally have on this list because I was watching somebody who's gonna come up in a different category. <laughs> I was watching Meg with Books's uh, book awards while I was getting ready this morning and she had a category on hers that was best twist and we are gonna pick the same one which is The Twyford Code by Janice Hallett. She, I picked this up on her recommendation and I agree. I think that this was probably the best twist I, I saw this year. My only qualm with it is I'm not totally sure you could like, I don't want to spoil anything. So I'm not sure that this is a twist you can at all unpack. So if you want like fair play in your mystery or thriller, that might hold you back from this. But in terms of the twist being satisfying and well executed, I think she did kind of nail it. So I do, and, and Meg was talking about this and she's totally right. This is the kind of book that you could read a second time after knowing what the twist is and get a lot more out of it or get different things out of it because of how transformative it is. So. I will agree with her. I think that this was the best twist I read this year. Okay, and then where are we? Oh, we're on biggest disappointment. Okay, well, biggest disappointment. You know what? I'm actually going to break this into two different things. I originally had biggest fail, but I'm going to replace my biggest fail with my biggest disappointment. That was Zodiac Academy, the first book, because when I started it, I was like, oh, I'm going to really like this, actually, I think. Like when I was reading the synopsis, I was like, oh, this sounds like trashy, campy fun. I can't wait. And then I actually actually got into it and I had to DNF it because it was agony. So that was probably the biggest disappointment because I went from like, oh, I think that this is going to be so fun to like, not for me. Worst. I could say that this was the worst written. I could say that this was the worst twist or the worst ending. I could say that these were the worst characters. This was the worst book. This is one of my all time least favorite books now. And that is Daisy Darker by Alice Feeney. If you didn't know, if you watched the channel at all, you knew this was coming. This was so bad. I hated this and it made me rant, which is so rare. So just worst all around. Every worst category you can think of, it's worst. Even the cover. Let's just even say the cover. I actually don't feel that way, but we'll pretend. Okay, so it was meant to be biggest disappointment and then biggest biggest accomplishment. I have two. So first, my biggest accomplishment is finishing season one of, of my podcast, which was doing my reread slash reading up to the current release of Psy Changeling. So I got to interview Nalini Singh last year on the podcast, which was great. And then I got to be a part of her book launch for this book, Storm Echo, this year, which was also such an honor. So um, I was really, I'm proud of myself that I made it all the way through, like figuring out how to do a podcast and staying consistent with it. Yeah, so I did season one. And then I'm also in the middle of wrapping up season two, which was for Innkeeper Chronicles, like we were talking about earlier. So reading and content wise, that felt like the biggest accomplishment. But 
I have to say, when I'm honestly, the first thing that came to mind was becoming Meg's book twin feels like the biggest accomplishment. And I was like, why did this feel so, I just was so excited and so moved by that. And I think it's because getting to see, like I recommended three books to her and she loved them all, which is why we're book twins. But thinking about, this is what, it, it was like I got to see in real time what I hear people reporting back to me, which is like when I recommend a book to them and they love it, that is just like every time you guys tell me that you love a book I recommend it, it's like that's why I do this. This is so, it's just such a serotonin hit of like, oh yes, I helped this person find a book that they love and getting to see a whole video of somebody loving books that I specifically picked out for them based on what I knew about their taste. It just was like the biggest serotonin hit in the entire world. So that is my biggest accomplishment was also because I'm so competitive winning. I'm not gonna lie, winning felt really good. It felt uh, like it's the way things should be. It felt like what I am destined to do, which is win. All I do is win, like DJ Khaled. <laughs> that was honestly what came to mind to me when I thought about biggest accomplishment. New favorite author officially is T. Kingfisher. I have not disliked any book that I've read from her and two of the three books I have given four and a half stars. So I think we can safely say she's a new favorite author. She combines kind of a lightness of touch or a quirkiness of perspective with some like real themes and some real darkness. And that combination is perfect for me. I love that. So yeah, T. Kingfisher is a new favorite author. A new auto buy author for me, not because I think I'm necessarily gonna love everything she puts out, but because her her project is just for me. And that is Allie Hazelwood. This is who I was thinking of earlier when I was saying some some things about writing are subjective. I know some people hate the way she writes. I love it. It's so fan servicey and fan fictiony. And it reminds it just it's in the best way. It feels like yummy yummy candy. Like it's so just fan fiction and I love it. So for me, her plot types, her writing, her project just works for me. So she's officially an auto buy. And then best debut, I am going to give to A Magic Steeped in Poison by Judy Lynn. Some of this is because I actually didn't love a lot of the debuts I read this year. But also I think that this is a super strong debut. I can tell in some ways because of, I think some of the character development didn't quite come together the way I would have in a perfect world liked to see it. But I really love the story. I love that it's a duology and that it's like self-contained. I think that the world building and magic system in this were super imaginative. And this is just really good YA fantasy. Like this is what I like from YA fantasy. It doesn't feel like it's too much trying to read to an adult audience who also reads YA. This feels like somebody who's actually 15 could pick this up and enjoy it. Like, yeah, I just feel like this was a super strong debut, undersung in my opinion. And then the last for the superlatives, uh, best cover. So I actually have three. I decided to go with one, which is I think the most beautiful cover. So I think The Daughter of the Moon Goddess by Sue Lin Tan had the most beautiful cover this year. This wasn't my favorite book. I didn't hate it. It was just sort of mid for me, but I think the cover is absolutely gorgeous. For romance cover, I want to give it to The Dragon's Bride by Katie Robert. I love that this has kind of like a storybook quality to it. I love all of the covers in this, this monster fantasy romance series she's doing. And I think this one in particular was really beautiful uh, and a good version of what it is. And then um, for nonfiction, I wanted to give it to I'm Glad My Mom Died because I felt like it was you know, it's a celebrity memoir. So you want to have the celebrity on the cover, like that's a part of how you're going to sell books. But something about that contrasting sort of like 80s yellow and pink, the font, and the fact that she's like cheekily holding this pink, like bright baby pink urn, there's something about it that communicates it's a very cheeky inspection of a very serious topic. Like I just felt like this communicated the tone of the book really well and uh, still kind of hit the beats of what you would probably want from a marketing perspective for a celebrity memoir. So A plus to the team who put that one together. Okay, and now we're gonna transition into stats. So buckle up. We're gonna start with the stat that I am most proud of by far, which is my net TBR numbers for the year. So, I started adding this stat to my monthly hauls. It has been good accountability for me and helped me 
stay on top of my TBR. And I am beyond proud to report that for the first time in 11 years since I started tracking this number, my TBR has gone down from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. And it hasn't just gone down by, you know, a few books. It wasn't like I started the year with 100 books on my TBR and now I have 98. No, no, no. I reduce this by 31 books, negative 31 for the year. Now, is this in part driven by me discovering some clerical errors in my TBR spreadsheet that was double counting books? Yes, it is. Is it also in part driven by me realizing that I had misclassified some books as being on my TBR that were actually just reference books? Again, yes, okay? But a win is a win. You know, we're gonna take it and I am so proud that I stayed on top of things that, and that I eliminated 253 books from my TBR this year. So I feel really good about that. I bought a lot of books. I always buy a lot of books. I read between 150 to 300 books a year. So, you know, it's a lot. There's, that's a lot of books. And so there's a lot of books coming in the door. But this year, I think by focusing on that stat and reporting it to you guys and having that accountability, I'm just really proud that that's where we're at. So we're hoping that we're taking that energy into 2023. I do have a couple of projects I think that you guys will be hearing about in my reading plans videos that are coming up in the next couple of weeks. I actually do have a focus for 23, an intention to kind of get some of the older things on my TBR off, like read them or get rid of them kind of a thing so that this feels fresher. But you guys, I'm just so proud. <laughs> this is the stat I'm by far and away the most proud of. And then are there any other collection level stats I need to tell you about? I don't think so. Let's just go into my reading stats. Starting off with the total number of books that I read, I read a total of 288 books in 2022 in the calendar year 2022. So that is actually an increase of about 40 books over 2021, because I read 242, I think. So yes, yeah, so that's an increase of two of uh, 46 books year over year, which actually is disappointing to me. I would love to get to a point where I was actually reading around 200 books. That would be ideal but I just don't think I'm there yet. So so of those 288 books, I owned 222 of them. So that contributes to me doing a good job of getting things off my TBR. And then uh, I did not own 66 of them. And those mostly came from Kindle Unlimited or the library. I paid for 46.88% of the books I read. So I didn't either get them from the library or whatever, or for free from a publisher or... <sighs> For, as a free ebook, which I tend to get a lot of those. So I paid for 46.88% and the average amount that I paid for those books was $5.72. I should mention that I'm also not including rereads in this list, which I'm thinking about changing my approach. It would mess up though my year over year stats. I don't know. That's a whole other thing for me to think about. In any case, average age of book I read was six years old, which is newer books than what I read last year, which is ironic or unexpected because when you look at the breakdown years published, like what year books I read were published in, I did a much better job this year. It was closer to like a third of the books I read were released in 2022 versus in 2021. Almost half the books I read were released in that year. So I read fewer books released in the current year, but I think overall I read books that were newer. So the average age, all that to say overall was the these books were six years old. And then the average amount of time they had been on my TBR was nine months, which is an improvement year over year. I believe last year the average amount of time was a year. And my goal is someday to get that to be about six months. Because then I think I'm like staying on top of reading things that I want to read in the current moment for the most part. But in terms of pages read. I actually saw a big increase in this. Um, I mean, it makes sense because I read more number of books, but I read 88,804 pages in total for an average book length of 308 pages. Last year, I read about 71,000 pages. So a big page increase, more so it feels like than even just the number of books read. I read a lot more pages this year. So again, I don't love that. I'm trying like, well, I guess I love the pages going up. Ideally, I would be making more progress on some of like the chunky books on my TBR and so my number of books would go down and my page count would stay about the same. So we're maybe we're gonna get there eventually. 
I don't know. In terms of where I got books from, I had a, more books come from Amazon this year. I do think that probably is because I was reading through some of my free ebooks trying to get those off of my TBR. So I had that go up. I had rough, a little fewer number that I got from publishers this year, but roughly about the same year over year which was my second biggest category. And then my third biggest category was Kindle Unlimited. Not that surprising, because that tends to be where I get to my speculative romance from. Okay, and then maybe we'll do some of the demographic stuff. So 81.9% of the books I read were by women. I will say, because my goal is to get to 25% of books written by either men or mixed gender or non-binary, because I used to read overwhelmingly from men and now I read overwhelmingly from women. So I'm trying to get at least like a little bit more balance. So I did improve. Last year I did 14% and this year was 18%. It's actually the highest non-women writers since the year that I really started reading romance novels. So maybe slowly <laughs> over time we're gonna get back to a little bit more balance. Audiobook wise, down a little bit. Audiobooks in general I feel like I have just not done as much since I've started working from home. It takes more intention for me to like purposely try to get to audiobooks. So I read one more audiobook than last year but as a percentage it was actually even fewer. So yeah, still working on trying to get that more back in the mix. For YA and middle grade, I actually went up year over year. So I read about twice, a little more than twice as many YA or middle grade than I did last year, 12.5%. So a lot of YA middle grade stuff tends to be like cozy, cozy reads for me or comfy reads. So yeah, that feels about right. Standalone versus in a series. I continue to be surprised at how many standalones I read. I think in my mind, I read a lot more things in series than I actually do. So in a series was 51.6% but that's nearly 50-50. And if I were guessing, I would have said it's like 65-35. And that was also true last year. I thought I read more things in series than I actually did. I actually think I did a little bit better. No, I guess it was roughly same, about the same. So new to me authors, like authors I hadn't read from before was just under 40%, which was about what it was last year. Ideally, that would get closer to 50%. But you know, I feel like 40% means I'm not just stuck in a rut of always reading the same people over and over again. Like I am branching out a little bit. One last demographic thing before we get into genre and rating. So like me versus not like me, this is my category where I try to capture is the author or main character meaningfully different from me in some way so that I'm reading from a wide variety of perspectives. This is, you know, sexuality or race, ethnicity, religion, like, am I hearing from different perspectives? And I, my goal is 50-50 and this year I'm at 53% not like me, which is 1% up from last year. So this has proven out my theory of like building up a TBR pipeline that is more diverse and that has continued to sort of just pay off as the years go on. So that was great. And then yeah, let's talk about my star rating. So if you look at the bell curve, uh, heavily weighted in four stars. I think the biggest reason why this year, so 2022, I should say on the whole, felt like a much better reading year than 2021. It's interesting because if you look at the actual average, I think that in 2021, my average was like 3.46. And in 2022, the average was 3.44. So almost the same, if not lower, but I had nearly tw like basically twice as many four and a half star reads in 2022 versus 2021. So I think what happened is in 2021, there was a lot more just mid books, books that were fine, but not great. And I had a lot more great reads in 2022, which is why I think it felt better to me. So the peak of the bell curve is at the four star, which is awesome, because to me, that's an A minus. And that means that I'm also, you know, taking risks because I see some also things down at the bottom or the lower end of things, which means I'm trying, I'm branching out, I'm not just stuck in a rut and reading safe picks. Uh, I'm, reach, you know, pushing myself and sometimes those pushes are not successful. But, um, but I, you know, I try to think of my 
my bad reads or be reads I did not enjoy is that means that meant I was going for something. And then last but not least, genre breakout. So last year, my most read genre was speculative romance followed by mystery. And this year that is flopped. It is mystery followed by speculative romance. And fantasy is my third runner up uh, for the second year in a row. I will say I read more fantasy books this year than I've ever read before. And it is going up over time. I do think that I see that as an alignment with my taste. I think over time I like fantasy more and more. I tend to get my sci-fi fix from speculative romance. So I read a lot of sci-fi romance. And then I read a lot of fantasy that is not doesn't have a romantic element. So anyway, I thought that was interesting. And a huge dip in other romance. So I didn't even break those out into separate categories. Just all other romances number four, but um, way fewer contemporary and historical romances read this year because I just was not finding things that were appealing to me. Fifth place is nonfiction of any kind. Uh, then I had sort of other fiction. So like general fiction, classics, historical, short stories, any of that kind of stuff was in there. Uh, horror, this is the first year I started tracking horror as its own thing as opposed to a mystery or sci-fi fantasy book. And then sci-fi, just general sci-fi at the bottom. So yeah, I think those are all of my stats for the year. And it occurred to me while I was making dinner that I forgot to tell you about my reading Roberts update. So I am trying to read every book Nor Roberts ever wrote. And as of the end of 2022, by my count, there are 267 books to read. I have 159 that are unread. I have read 40.45%. And in 2022, I read 12. So that's roughly the equivalent of a book a month. I would like to probably double that next year. So we'll see. But anyway, I just realized I did not tell you how I did on that particular challenge. I should say that my current rating is 3.42 and that went down from 3.6 in 2021. So I definitely had some stinkers I read this year or even a couple that I DNF'd. So there you go. Okay, that's all I wanted to interject here. Uh, I didn't compile any channel stats, but I know I went up in subscribers. So thank you to those of you who've joined the fun since then. So yeah, with that, I think that brings 2022 officially to a close here on the channel. I hope you have enjoyed all the lists and the re, you know, ranking things and stats and super. I thank you for indulging me. I love this time of year. It's my absolute favorite thing to make on booktube. So thank you for coming along for the ride. Let me know what if you've got any answers for any of the superlatives I mentioned. Let me know if any of the stats surprised you if you're at all invested or if you just are humoring me by letting me talk about them. Uh, let me know that in the comments below. And yeah, I think that that will do it for this video. So if you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe, follow me on the social means if you are so inclined. I have all that information listed in the description box below. And I think that that will do it. I hope you are having an absolutely lovely day today. Hope you're having a good 2023 so far. And I will just talk to you soon. Bye!